So today I'm reacting to Ryan Crowley's devastating injury while working out with Larry Wheels. And I'm going to discuss five critical considerations for his recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? This video is sponsored by Human 2.0, your trusted source for online training in body weight exercise, kettlebells, animal flow, primal movement, and injury prevention. I'm Dr. Chris Rayner, and I am not your everyday ortho. I make sports injuries, orthopedic surgery, and medical topics easy to understand and entertaining so that your experience with healthcare can be better. Okay. Today for orthopedic rounds, I'm gonna review a video posted by Larry Wheels about bodybuilder Ryan Crowley. I will share my thoughts on the injury that was shown, and I will discuss discuss five critical factors to consider for Ryan's recovery from this injury and his return to bodybuilding in the future. Several of you have asked me to take a look at this injury, so let's give it a rip. Other content creators have spoken about this injury, so I will focus most of my attention on the factors that will influence the speed and the success of Ryan Crowley's rehabilitation. This is going to be a bit of a longer video, so you can use the time points to skip ahead for specific comments. Ryan Crowley is a young bodybuilder from the UK who has been training with American Strongman and bodybuilder Larry Wheels. Several days ago, Larry Wheels posted a video on his social media of an injury that Ryan Crowley suffered while they were training together. The injury occurred while they were performing heavy incline press with 220 kilograms or 485 freaking pounds. What'd you say? 485 freaking pounds. Ryan was able to successfully take the bar off the rack with some assistance from wheels. On his first repetition, he appeared to be struggling with what is a monumental amount of weight. As he neared his chest on the negative phase of the lift, a catastrophic injury occurred with an immediate deformity of his upper chest on the right hand side. Ryan was unable to complete the lift and he immediately bailed sliding off the bench in the process. Subsequent pictures from Wheels showed an extensively bruised and swollen Crowley in the hospital and within a short time Wheels indicated that Crowley was undergoing surgery to repair a ruptured pectoralis tendon in his chest. So now that you have the Coles Notes summary of what happened, let's talk about the five critical factors that influence the injury and that will affect its repair and ultimately Ryan Crowley's future in bodybuilding. Number one, tendon maturity with respect to the etiology of the injury. What? Crowley is a young genetically gifted bodybuilder who is six foot three and weighs over 327 pounds. He is a massive human being who has dedicated his life to muscle hypertrophy and building size. No doubt he is significantly stronger than the average human being. However, his focus is on hypertrophy in symmetry, not absolute strength. Larry Wheels, on the other hand, is a professional powerlifter and bodybuilder who is six foot one with a competition weight between 245 and 255 pounds. Although he started out as a bodybuilder, he subsequently added on powerlifting, ultimately becoming one of the strongest powerlifters in the world. While Wheels does train for bodybuilding, his primary focus is on powerlifting, and as such, his body is not only built for size, but also for absolute strength. While Crowley is likely the larger of the two athletes, it is likely that Wheels is the stronger of the two. With a focus on powerlifting and absolute strength, both Wheels' muscles and tendons are primed for one rep maximum lifts. Muscles, tendons, and bones grow in response to forces that are applied to them. Bones become more dense, the size and contractility of muscles increases, and the resilience of tendons improves in a measure that reflects the stresses that are applied to them. Wheels spends much of his time lifting very heavy loads, and over time, his tendons have become accustomed to these maximal loads. This includes the musculotendinous junction, where the muscle and tendon meet, the tendon itself, and the tendon bone attachment. All are adapted to this singular goal of generating the absolute largest amount of power. Crowley, on the other hand, has trained his bones, muscles, and specifically his tendons to adapt to high volumes of submaximal loads in order to promote hypertrophy. While the overall volume of weight that they lift might be comparable, the manner in which they do so is entirely different. Consequently, Crowley, although strong, is much less prepared for single one rep maximum lifts. The cross-sectional anatomy of his bones, muscles, and tendons is likely much different than that of wheels. As a result, he was not able to perform the maximal incline press successfully, not because he lacked the strength, but rather because the connective tissue of his tendons was not appropriately adapted. When faced with a maximal load, the pectoralis muscle failed at its weakest point during the most difficult portion of the lift, 
the eccentric phase. During this part of the movement, the muscle is contracting while at the same time it is lengthening. This is the point at which it is most mechanically disadvantaged and the most likely to fail. Usually, it is the sternocostal head that fails, quite frequently at the tendinous insertion on the humerus. Usually, this occurs in a predictable sequence through the inferior fibers of the sternocostal head, then the superior fibers, and finally, the clavicular head. Number two, location of the injury with respect to the tendon. There are several locations in which the muscle can potentially fail. These include the muscle belly itself, the musculotendinous junction, the tendon, or at the site of the tendon insertion on the bone. It is not entirely clear where the failure occurred in Crowley, but the video gives us clues as to what occurred. First, the loud snap <laughs> that can be heard at the moment of rupture is characteristic of tendinous injuries. Patients often describe the sound of hearing a gunshot at the moment that the tendon snaps. This points towards a tendon injury or an injury at the bone tendon interface. The location of the injury is important because it determines the repairability of the injured muscle. Tears that occur in the belly of the muscle are not repairable. These tears cannot be readily sutured back together. It's kind of like trying to sew two pieces of steak together. The muscle fibers are too fragile to be sewn together in this manner. As you tension the sutures, they rip through the muscle fibers in much the same way as would a garrote. Tears that occur within the tendon are much more repairable because the tendon tissue is much more robust than are the muscle fibers. Sutures are much less able to cut through tendon tissue than through muscle tissue. Injuries that occur at the junction where muscle fibers transition to tendon fibers suffer a similar degree of repairability as muscle belly tears for much the same reason. While the tendinous portion of the muscle can retain sutures very well, the muscular portion cannot. Injuries that occur at the bone tendon interface are quite repairable as there is an opportunity to reattach the tendon directly to the bone through a number of methods. Avulsions at the tendinous insertion on the bone are the most common presentation of this injury. Number three, how to repair the injury. There are several ways to repair tendinous avulsions of the pectoralis tendon. The three methods include transosseous suture repair with a cortical trough, cortical button fixation, and suture anchor repair. For the first method, the tendon is captured using several high tensile strength sutures, leaving free suture ends. Tunnels are drilled through the humerus through which the free suture ends are passed. The cortical or surface bone is roughened up around the holes in such a manner that when the sutures are tightened and tied, the tendon is drawn down onto the surface of the bone where it can adhere to the trough in the roughened area. Over time, as the repair matures, the tendon and bone grow together at this trough, restoring a biological interface. The second method of fixation involves, again, capturing the tendon with sutures. Holes are drilled through a single cortex of the humerus to allow access to the inside of the bone. Here, the free suture ends are attached to a cortical button that is passed through one cortex of the humerus into the inside of the bone. When the sutures are tightened, the tendon is drawn down onto the surface of the bone. The sutures are then tied and sewn to the tendon in its reduced position. The third method of fixation involves the implantation of suture anchors into the bone of the humerus. These are devices that are punched or screwed into the bone to which sutures are attached. These sutures are used to capture the torn end of the tendon. When the sutures are tensioned, the tendon is reduced back to the humerus. It is tied and sewn to the tendon in its reduced position. For the first method of fixation, the repair results in a biological interface where the tendon heals within the cortical bone. For the second and third methods of fixation, the repair results in an interface where the tendon heals onto the surface of the cortical bone. While it would seem that a repair into the bone would be more secure, all repair techniques have been shown to have comparably excellent results. It is not clear which method of fixation was used for Crowley's surgery, but the results should be comparable whichever method was used. Number four, likelihood of return to bodybuilding. Repairing the pectoralis tendon will restore the normal function of the pectoral muscle. Bodybuilding is not necessarily what we, as orthopedic surgeons, would consider normal function. It is not that training is not normal, but rather that it represents supra-physiologic loads, or in other words, loads that are not necessarily seen in everyday tasks. With bodybuilding, Crowley will need to train with high volumes of sub-maximal weights. Here, volume is the key for muscle hypertrophy, not necessarily the absolute heaviest weights possible. This is fortunate because it lessens the demands that are required for the repaired tendon to withstand or accommodate. One of the complications after repair of the pectoralis tendon is re-rupture of the tendon which occurs with a frequency of 5 to 7% in the normal population. <laughs> Crowley is not of the normal population, but rather the supranormal population, since he will be subjecting the repair to supra 
physiologic loads. I would venture to guess that his likelihood of re-rupture or failure of the repair will be towards the upper end of that range and possibly even higher as a result of his training. Will it be possible for Crowley to return to bodybuilding? Let me know what you think in the comments. From my perspective, it is definitely possible, but the timeline will be somewhat protracted and the repair will add a new element that Crowley must consider when training. He will have to be quite gradual with his progression of his training and he will have to follow the guidance of his surgeon and his physiotherapist. He will also have to listen to his body quite closely as his training volume and weights ramp up. This will certainly not be the time to grin and bear it. Number five, likelihood of symmetry after repair. Bodybuilding is all about sculpting the perfect physique and symmetry is a significant part of this process. It is important for athletes to not only have a size and mass, but also to have a physique that is perfectly balanced from side to side. After this injury, Crowley will have significant deficits in muscle mass, strength, flexibility, and range of motion of the affected shoulder. While these deficits are likely to affect both upper extremities, they will be especially pronounced for the operative side. Rehabilitation back to regular day-to-day -day function may take upwards of six months. Restoration of his competitive physique and elimination of any cosmetic asymmetries may take one year or more. And once symmetry is attained, his overall size is likely to be smaller than that at which he competed previously. Can he attain his previous size following this injury? What are your thoughts? Only time will tell, but it will definitely take combination of determination, perseverance, patience, and good fortune to get things back on track. If there are any other critical factors that you think that I may have missed or that you want me to cover, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching and I will see you for rounds next week. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday or dope. Just a flesh wound.